The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome. Order of Liturgy today is Matins. It uh, goes back to um, about the 3rd or 4th century, I think. Um, this it, it, Matins literally means uh, the morning song of birds. The morning song of birds. Uh, it was the last of the night liturgies um, uh, uh, of the monasteries. You know, they were... Every three hours they had a service through the night, and this is the last one of them, and it was intended to end with dawn. Notice the first line, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. That's Psalm 51. Another way of thinking of it is, unless you open my lips, Lord, it's not going to happen. I won't be able to praise you. First off, because of the hour of the day, right? <laughs> But secondly, because faith is a gift, um, uh, praise is a gift that he enables us to do. So uh, do think about that as we go through matins, uh, particularly that first la line, O oh Lord, open my lips, and then if you do that, then I will declare, I will be able to declare your praise. Opening hymn, Father Most Holy 504. <laughs> O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now.
Thus it be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O come, let us worship Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O come, let us worship Him. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation, when his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day he plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Amos chapter 6. Woe to those who are ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountains of Samaria, the notable men of the first of the nations, to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kalna and see, and from there go, go to Hamath the Great, and go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is there a territory greater than your territory? Or you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence? Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. This is the word of the Lord. 
The epistle is from 1 Timothy chapter 3. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit, and he may fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into, into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. 
And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died, was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died, was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Give to the Lord all glory and strength. Give him the honor to his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Give the Lord all glory and strength. Give him the honor to his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Give to the Lord our glory and strength. Give him the honor to his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon text is the gospel lesson we just read. As a child, I liked this story. The rich man was living the high life, practically oblivious that a poor man named Lazarus was rotting at his gate. Both men die. The rich man wakes up screaming in hell, while Lazarus is carried up to heaven by the angels of God. As a child, this, this story appealed to my sense of justice. As an adult, however, I don't get as much pleasure out of this parable. I know I have a standard of living that makes me wealthy compared to most of the rest of the world. And I know the global village phenomenon has brought Lazarus to my front gate with his wet, infected sores and his burning hunger. And I know all it would take is a phone call, a credit card, and I'd be able to do much more than I have been doing to ease the suffering of others. So this parable isn't so easy and comfortable and pleasing to me anymore. It pricks my ears. And if it doesn't prick yours, you probably haven't heard it yet. 
It's a continuation of last week's gospel lesson, which Jesus ended up by saying, you cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees didn't respond well to the statement, quote, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard these things and ridiculed him. It was their ridicule, their love of money that prompted Jesus to tell this story. Poor Lazarus was a pathetic form unloaded every day at the front gate of this rich man like the morning newspaper. Sick, helpless, unable to work, lying in his own filth, gradually wasting away. So weak he's not even able to shoo away the street dogs that are desperately wanting to lick his open sores. Lazarus dies. His funeral service was a pathetic affair, bare bones, pauper's funeral. No music, no eulogy, no processional. No luncheon with seven layer salad from Glenn's Meat Market. But Lazarus doesn't care one little bit because he's already enjoying the splendors of heaven. Meanwhile, there lives on the other side of the gate a rich man dressed in purple, exclusively expensive stuff, dining sumptuously every day. The clock keeps ticking, however, and the fine purple linen begins to hang about his thin shoulders. The lovely meals pre carefully prepared and presented come and go having barely been tasted. There are doctors, best money can buy, or medicines, or painkillers, but no amount of wealth can put off forever the inevitable. So the rich man also dies. Then follows a lavish funeral, well attended drop-dead gorgeous coffin, ashamed to bury it into the soil. An impressive processional, followed by one last sumptuous meal on the rich man's dime. All the right people say all the right things, but their words don't mean a thing, because the rich man has already woken up in hell. By the way, I've done probably 350 funerals by now, and not once, not once have family members worried out loud whether their loved one was in heaven or in hell. They were all shoe-ins for eternal bliss, locked in, no ifs, ands, or buts, you can bet the farm on it. But I've not always enjoyed their certainty Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to eternal life. And those who find it are few. Seems to me like we've reversed those words. Now everyone gets into heaven because the path is so wide, so easy, and because grace is so cheap. In any case, the rich man in the parable doesn't make the cut. He wakes up in his horror in hell. Now, keep your eyes on those Pharisees who ridiculed Jesus. Remember, the story is for them initially. It's not a condemnation of wealthy people. It's a sharp commentary on a group of people who loved wealth and at the same time were content to believe that people who were poor or sick deserved to be poor or sick. The Pharisees had a very simplistic way of thinking about the world. If you had it, you deserved it. Whether wealth or poverty, health or illness, if you had it, you deserved it. And truth be told, many of us hang on to those simplistic assumptions. Poor people are usually poor because of their poor decisions, right? Or because they're lazy, indolent. The world isn't quite so simple. And Jesus isn't going to let the Pharisees or us 
get away with such simplistic assumptions. He knows we're deeply impressed with the rich and powerful. And so he sends this rich and powerful guy straight to hell to teach us there are some things money can and cannot do. And he knows we're not so much impressed with the poor. And so he has his angels gently, reverently carrying Lazarus up to heaven. Again, because there are some things money can and cannot do. Now remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. The only way anyone gets into heaven is by grace through faith. That's clear. And the only way anyone gets into hell is by unbelief. That too is clear. The rich man is not in hell because of his wealth. And he's not in hell because of his neglect of Lazarus. He's in hell because of his unbelief. Maybe his wealth encouraged unbelief. After all, it's hard to pray for your daily bread when you've already laid aside enough gold to last maybe two, three lifetimes worth of daily bread. And his neglect of Lazarus, that's just evidence of unbelief because where there is faith, there will always be good works. Where there's faith, there will always be works of mercy. And Lazarus is not in heaven because of his poverty. Poverty is no free pass into paradise. In fact, the poor man can be just a tough a nut to crack as the rich man for the Lord. Lazarus gets into heaven the only way anyone else gets into heaven, by grace through faith. Though the rich man is in hell, he still assumes he can order people around, that people will listen to his demands. So he calls up to heaven and tells Abraham to send Lazarus down so that he might, quote, dip the end of his finger in water and, and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Abraham refuses, reminds the rich man he's already had his full measure of pleasures on earth. And besides, between us and you, there's this great chasm, a great divorce that cannot be crossed. There's no going back and forth. Perhaps for the first time, the rich man starts worrying about other things, others for a change. Specifically, he's thinking about his five brothers. He's hoping they can get their act together before it's too late. Send someone from the dead, he tells Abraham, to warn them. That's all the rich man is asking for, not a big request. Just send someone to startle and scare them into the faith. But again, Abraham says, clearly, you don't get it. There's no more wheeling and dealing for you. You're done. Forget about it. Besides, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, the rich man says. All that Bible stuff is not enough. Not enough. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Abraham, he doesn't give an inch. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. As a child, I remember thinking to myself, I disagree. Dead man coming to talk to me, that would help me get my act straight. Took me a while to understand God doesn't want fearful acquiescence. He wants our faith, our trust. He doesn't want us coming to him quivering with fear, but like a dear child comes to his dear father. The rich man's fate is sealed, cannot be changed. But there's still time for his five brothers, right? They haven't died yet. And they are the key to this parable. They are the key to the correct understanding of this parable. This parable is really about them, though they're mentioned only in passing. They represent every living person on this planet, including you and me. Word is right underneath our noses. 
Those who don't yet believe still have opportunity to hear and believe if only they stop resisting the Holy Spirit. But if they reject God's word, if they reject Moses and the prophets, they will suffer the same fate as the rich man. This parable then is about hearing the good news and receiving it by faith before it's too late. It's about getting that word out to your brothers and sisters, your nieces and nephews, your neighbors, workers, co-workers, and, and friends before it's too late. It's the word that makes us wise unto salvation, the Bible says. In Isaiah, God says his word is like rain. It waters the earth, making it bud and flourish so that it can yield seed for the grower and bread for the eater. It's like the rain, Isaiah says, that makes your grass grow like the dickens, right? And it makes, it enlivens people as well. It infuses them with life. Let them listen to Moses and the prophets. This isn't just an invitation, it's also a promise. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Don't wait for some other extraordinary confirmation. God is not, he never promises to open up the heavens and perform a miracle for you or anyone else. To stun you or anyone else out of lackluster, tepid, half-hearted faith. He's not going to bring you to your knees with an extraordinary vision of him in heaven. He wants faith, not acquiescence. He wants trust, not fear. They have the word, let them listen to it. It's all we have. Nothing more, nothing less. Not a visit from the dead. Not a personal guru in India. Not a sign or coincidence or a close call that will knock your socks off. We have the word of God. The lowly word of God. And it's enough. It does every day what a visitor from the dead could never do. It enkindles faith and trust and joy. Even from childhood, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise to salvation, which have made you wise to salvation. If you worry about whether you have faith, you have it, CFW Walter said, because the unbeliever never worries about such things. Finally, this parable reminds us before God, we're all beggars, all helpless, all as desperate as Lazarus sitting out there by the gate. We can give him nothing but our filth and our sin and our sickness. We can't help ourselves. We can't spiritually pull ourselves up out of our mess and do the work required to earn salvation. Only God can help us. And the good news is he has helped us. Unlike that rich guy who did nothing for Lazarus, God has done everything for us. In Jesus Christ, God has reached out to us. He has cleansed us with his forgiveness. He has bound up our wounds with his love. He has fed us sumptuously with his body and blood, lifted us up with his strong arms. He has created faith in you by his word. Whether rich or poor, he desires that all should be saved. From the cross, he has loved us with an everlasting love and wants nothing more than for the angels to carry us up to heaven or to accompany us himself and has promised the same to all who believe and are baptized. Thanks be to God. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
This is the time in the worship service when we bring our offerings to the Lord. God, our Father, has been so generous to us, and we respond to his generosity with our own thanks and praise and generosity. When I write out a check to this church, I try really hard not to think about the We Energy bill for Good Shepherd, or even worse, the load of salt for Good Shepherd's parking lot. I try to think about the blessings God has showered down upon me and upon my family. In my mind, I, I quietly do a little exercise. I go through the Apostles' Creed, just kind of in the roughest terms, the first, second, third article stuff of the Creed. I think in the first article of the Creed, when we turn our attention to God our Father, creator of heaven and earth, the bodies he's given us so fearfully and wonderfully made, the shoes and clothing, food, house, home, uh, um, family, friends, spouse, children, all that we have that supports our bodies and our lives. I also then go on to the second article of the creed where we confess Jesus as our redeemer from sin and death, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and his innocent sufferings and, and, and death. Then I think of the third article of the Creed where we confess the work of the Holy Spirit where he gives us faith so that we can open our mouths and declare the Lord's praises. Where he gathers us into his church through holy baptism. Where he richly and daily forgives us our sins. And of course the comfort and the assurance of eternal life to all who believe and are baptized. The idea of pray, paying for Good Shepherd's electric bill is no more appealing to me than praying for our own home electric bill. It always seems too high. However, giving thanks to God with our offerings for all his blessings, first, second, third article stuff, that feels good. Feels like the right thing to do. I wish I could do more. Instead of a bill that, that seems too high, it feels like a sacrifice of thanksgiving that's too small. We continue with our offerings. In our prayers, we pray for those who have been ill, for Mary Reichert and Karen Kaditz, for Chris Lundstrom and Daniel Eastrake, 
Jerry Brandemule, Sarah Schaefer, Sue Gehring, mother of Kim Schramm. We pray for the family of Frances Vins, um, who died this past week, last Sunday. Her funeral was on Thursday. We pray for the family of Marion Beisner, mother of Mary Beisner, whose funeral was yesterday. Please stand for prayer. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry. Almighty God, preserve us from the temptation of complacency, lest we confuse your undeserved mercy with sinful self-righteousness, and replace repentance with revelry. Give to us penitent hearts that acknowledge our utter sinfulness and rejoice in your unmerited grace, that we might abandon all trust in ourselves and render all glory to your Son, crucified and risen for us. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord of hosts, as we wrestle against not just flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil, you send forth your angels to protect and preserve us. Watch over those who are under spiritual assault, Clothe them in Christ's righteousness and remind them that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Receive our thanks for your angelic provision and continue to set your guardian angels over us that the evil foe may have no power over us until the eternal day when your evil is no, when, when evil is no more and with the angels we behold your face in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, you open the eyes of the blind and lift up those who are bowed down. Hear our prayers on behalf of those in need of your mercy. For Mary, Karen, Chris, Daniel, Jerry, Sarah, Sue, and Gail. Provide restoration, deliverance according to your good and gracious will. We pray also for the family of Francis and for the family of Marion. Give to them hope and assurance that by grace through faith, their dear ones are with you and with all the, the saints in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, as you once gave Moses and the prophets so that people might hear your word, continue to provide pastors and other laborers to make your gospel known among the nations. Preserve those who currently serve within your church and raise up more workers to labor in the harvest. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise your name for your faithfulness to Abraham, Lazarus, and to all the saints who have gone before us. Enliven us by your word and sacraments that, convinced of Jesus' death and resurrection, we may eagerly await the day of our resurrection for his sake. Through him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O God, you are the strength of all who trust in you, and without your aid we can do no good thing. Grant us the help of your grace that we may please you in both will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.